organisation called Subterranea Britannica. I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. We organise and run the tours here at Paddock. Before we actually start uh, with the tour, uh, I have a, uh, a safety brief which I'm uh, required to read out to you. Right, you've all been provided with hard hats. These must be worn at all times, and it's the condition of you joining the tour that you wear your hat. If you're unwilling to wear a hat, uh, then one of my fellow guides will escort you to the surface now. Oh, nope, looks all right, all right. Eating, drinking, smoking, and sex are not <laughs> permitted at any time during the tour. The floor of the bunker is wet and uneven in places. Please watch where you're walking and take care when using the stairs. Please hold on to the handbrake. If you suffer from any medical condition such as claustrophobia, epilepsy, asthma, high blood pressure and hypoglycemia, or a prone to fits or fainting, please let one of the mark guides know before we start the tour. Please don't leave the main tour or wander off on your own. Many of the rooms have debris on the floor and shouldn't be entered. Please don't cross any of the hazard tape. A guide will be at the rear of the party at all times to make sure that you comply. Throughout the bunker there's extensive mould growth. This is perfectly safe, but we ask you not to touch any mould or fungus. Please also don't touch any of these stalactites hanging from the ceiling, as these will break off easily. There are no rats or nasty things in the bunker, apart from Bob Clary. <laughs> Firefighting equipment is located at entry level uh, at each end of the corridor on both uh, lower levels. In the event of an emergency evacuation, or if we are unable to use the main stairs for some reason, please follow the instructions of the guides who will lead you out via an emergency exit located at the south end of the bunker. Um, should you feel unwell or decide you don't wish to continue with the tour at any time, please ask one of the guides for assistance. The tour involves using narrow spiral staircases. If anyone's unable to use these stairs or would prefer to use the main staircase between the floors, please ask one of the guides for assistance. I would advise, have a look at it first. If you don't fancy it, then we'll take it <coughs> on the main stairway. Those with small children or a mobility problem must not use the spiral stairs again. Ask the guys for assistance. At the end of the tour, please return all wristbands so you can be safely accounted for. The tour will last approximately 50 minutes and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. Of course, do feel free to ask questions throughout. Right, where are we? Got a photograph here of the post office research station. Right, that building's still there. That's uh, been very nicely converted into luxury flats. That's still there. That's an industrial estate. All these buildings have gone. This is now housing. There's housing along Brook Road. And this little building here, unfortunately in shadow a bit, with the little ventilation tower, tower that's where we are. Uh, it was part of the post office research station. It had the code name Paddock, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Uh, but that's Brook Road there. Uh, so the original entrance was at, at the back of the building. So you entered through uh, the front of the building, uh, and that's a new doorway put in uh, towards the end of the 1990s to give access to the bunker. It was originally on three levels, two levels below ground, and one level which you can see here above ground, which has now been demolished. Right, why are we here? Why is Paddock here? Uh, at the end of uh, the First World War, it was thought that there might be another devastating attack on London. And if there was, then it was decided that uh, government need to move out of London. Uh, there were several proposals. Uh, one was to move uh, to the West Midlands. Another was to move to the West Country. Uh, but the favoured uh, proposal was to move to the West and Northwest suburbs. Uh, and that's how Paddock came to be built. I'll tell you more about that as we go along, but if you'd like to follow me along this corridor, the bunker had to give protection uh, against was a gas attack. Uh, and for that reason, uh, a supply of fresh, clean air uh, was needed throughout the bunker. And this is one of the ventilation plant rooms. Uh, the air is sucked in uh, through this trunking, through the fans, uh, into this filter unit here, and from there it can be fed around the bunker so that uh, anyone down here would be safe, would be able to uh, uh, breathe quite normally. Obviously, uh, uh, the only air available was the, uh, the air outside of the bunker on the surface, so uh, these filter units here would actually scrub uh, that air, take all the, uh, the poisons, the gases out of it, so there was a supply of fresh, clean air in the bunker. Everything in here is original, dating from 1939. We've got uh, fans, compressors, pumps, 
all to ensure a good supply of, of air through the bunker. And if you'd like to follow me over to the other side, uh, there's some more air filtration plant, and then we'll go down to the lower level. Units and into the metal trunking, which you'll see on the ceiling, uh, entering all the rooms in the bunker. Right, we're going to go downstairs. 40 feet below ground. There's five feet of solid concrete between this floor and the upper floor. And above the upper floor, there's another four feet of concrete and then sand and gravel up to the surface. So 40 feet below ground uh, at this sub-basement level. And uh, at that depth, we were, the bunker was able to survive a direct hit from the largest high explosive bomb uh, that the Germans could deliver. We had larger bombs than they did. We had the tall boy, and the tall boy would have penetrated a bunker at this, this depth. But the Germans didn't have anything of that size, so uh, anyone down here would have been perfectly safe uh, from a direct hit. Uh, not that that was actually likely to happen. Of course, in the atomic age, in the nuclear age, uh, even a small Hiroshima-sized Hiroshima atomic bomb dropping on this bunker, uh, it would be disintegrated, it would be just a hole in the ground. So it wouldn't have survived uh, that sort of attack. But uh, in World War II, in 1939, uh, when work started uh, on building this bunker, it started at the beginning of 1939, uh, it would have been completely safe down here. Now if you move into uh, this lower bathroom, the bunker was started in 1939. Uh, it was on an existing government site. It was in the grounds of the Post Office Research Station. All the work, if you'd like to follow me along the corridor, all the work was done at night uh, under camouflage netting and the local people didn't know it was here, didn't know what was being built. Uh, but in those days, of course, you didn't ask. Uh, if you started asking too many questions, you were carted away. Uh, so they knew the, uh, the Post Office Research Station was doing government work and they didn't realise that this was actually being built. Um, all the spoil was taken away at night by lorries uh, and uh, the bunker was uh, nearing completion uh, towards the start of the Blitz in September 1940. And that's when Churchill first came down here. He didn't feel that a bunker was ever going to be needed. Uh, but with the start of the Blitz, he was persuaded uh, to have a look at the bunker on his way uh, home at the end of a busy week, way home for the weekend, and he called in to see the bunker, and he saw um, exactly what had been built, and he began to realise that perhaps there was going to be a need for the bunker, and he decided that it was necessary to bring the war cabinet here uh, to actually see if the bunker was able to fulfil its purpose. Now the heart of the bunker uh, is on this level. This is where the, uh, the military plotting room was, this is where the war cabinet room was. And we're going to go now into uh, the military plotting uh, wars, uh, uh, films about World War II with military plotting rooms. Uh, you know the sort of thing, you, you get a room with plotting tables, with people pushing about little tanks with sticks, uh, and a gallery above uh, with uh, the controllers looking down on the plotting tables. If you've been to the uh, Battle of Britain War Room at uh, RAF Uxbridge, that's what you see there. This is the equivalent room. This is where uh, the military planning would have taken place. Um, there would have been maps on these walls here. And if you look at the light fittings, some of them have actually got angled shades. But these are fluorescent lights, which you might think had later, but no fluorescent lights were certainly around in the 1930s. Uh, so these shades are actually angling the lights onto the walls where the maps would have been. There are windows three into three separate rooms for each of the three services, for the uh, Air Ministry, for the Army and for the Admiralty. So anyone who actually didn't have any business in the room uh, but needed to see what was going on in the room, to see the maps, they would have been able to look through the windows uh, into this room. It was a busy room, it was the military heart of the bunker. This is where the war was actually, or our side of it anyway, was controlled from, or would have been. Um, it never happened. The bunker never needed to be used. But it was here as a standby. If the uh, cabinet war rooms in London had been taken out uh, by a devastating attack, then government would have moved here. You'll notice in the door over there, a little hatch. Uh, it's not a bit of wood from the door actually missing. It's what's called a message hatch. So that uh, if there's a message, 
uh, that needed to be handed to the plotters in this room. It could have been just passed through a little hole in the door. Otherwise, they would have had runners. In those days, that was the way of communicating uh, within uh, a building like this. You had people who take the message and they actually run to where, where it was required. So a vitally important room. Right, we're going to move on from the military part of the bunker to the administrative. They were cleared for <coughs> housing in uh, the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the name was remembered in Paddock Road, which is still there to this day. And it was believed that uh, the name Paddock came from Paddock Road. Uh, but that's not the way that the military or the government actually did things. They had uh, a list of code names, and the normal procedure was just to take the next one from the list. And it uh, is more uh, all around the room. Uh, Churchill would have sat approximately there facing his war cabinet. Again there would have been maps on the walls, uh, there are some more angled shades there, another one there, uh, and just through there there's a message, another message hatch and there are some rotting tables there. That was the teleprinter room. So we can't go in there because uh, all the woodwork disintegrates as you touch it. But if, if you'd like to just look through uh, the window before we move to 39. Uh, so the main means of communication was either by radio or by teleprinter. And uh, this uh, was a vitally important government building, so there were a massive amount of uh, GPO lines uh, bringing uh, the teleprinter signals and uh, the telephones into the bunker. Right, as I said, Churchill never actually wanted to come here, but uh, after visiting the bunker just after the start of the Blitz, he did decide that it was necessary for the War Cabinet to meet here. And that they did on the 3rd of October 1940. Uh, the meeting was chaired by Churchill, the whole War Cabinet was here, uh, and it was just to ensure that the bunker was able to fulfil its function. Um, and uh, there are few records surviving, but we know that the meeting went well. Churchill never came back after that date. Um, he was still not keen on the place, and in fact in his memoirs written in the 1950s, he described the bunker as far from the light of day. He also remembered it as being somewhere near Hampstead, uh, which it certainly did meet here in March 1941. Again, it was uh, decided that the bunker needed to be uh, tested to see if it could uh, uh, do exactly what it was supposed to do. But the other reason is because the Australian Premier, Robert Menzies, was visiting uh, the country at the time and it was uh, normal for him to address uh, the war cabinets on the Australian and New Zealand war effort. So it was perhaps decided to impress Robert Menzies and to bring him here so he was able to address the war cabinet, which he did in this room. He addressed the war cabinet for 40 minutes and I'm sure he was uh, mightily impressed uh, by the protected accommodation that we were able to offer. Uh, so Churchill wasn't here, he was away on business, so the meeting was chaired by the Lord Privy Seal, Clement Attlee. Now, we were uh, privileged enough to bring Attlee's grandson, the present Lord Attlee, here uh, about four or five years ago now. He actually contacted us and said he'd like to come uh, and see the bunker uh, because of the family connections with it. Uh, so we went and picked him up from the House of Lords, we brought him here and we gave him a, a tour of the bunker. I think he was here for a couple of hours and uh, he was exceeding, exceedingly interested uh, on what went on here. So that was a, a very interesting uh, experience both for us and for him. Right, so I've got a few testing questions for you. Um, if you'd like to follow me into a very small room, uh, what I'm going to ask you is what... Yeah. Uh, it's something that bunkers have always had uh, in the Cold War. Uh, the BBC always provided a studio uh, so that uh, the regional commissioner at that time or the prime minister or whoever could have broadcast to the area or to the nation. And that would have uh, taken place from this room. Where's well, the evidence is on the wall? On the right-hand wall there is acoustic, ti acoustic tiling over to keep it available for use uh, should it ever be needed. There were three entrances. Uh, there's the one we came in, uh, there's one at the south end, which is still our current emergency exit. That actually comes out in someone's garden, mm -hmm. so uh, we hope that we don't have to use that. And the third exit would have been through that doorway there, uh, where there would have been another spiral staircase up to the surface. That's now been uh, complete. People haven't suggested that it might be a wine rack. <laughs> Why would there need to be a wine rack in a government bunk? No, they're not all drinking church. Church and drink whiskey. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. 
This is what's called a main distribution frame. And anyone who's worked for BT or the GPO, if it was a few years back, will know exactly what that does. Uh, this was the telephone exchange. Uh, and this unit here, it, actually if you come around the other side of it, it's uh, a bit more to see. All the telephone lines would have come in on these hangers up here and would have fed into this unit. It's basically a, a lot of switches. Uh, these switch relays here. Uh, it would have switched all the telephone teleprinter lines uh, to all the various rooms throughout the bunker. And there's some really interesting evidence here. On this one, down here, CWR, Cabinet War Room. Well, it could be something else. We don't know for certain, but this was the Cabinet War Room, so it seems likely uh, that that particular bank of relays would be switching lines down to the Cabinet War Room below us. We've got here 100 PRS to MDF sub basement. That's 100 pairs of cables to the main distribution frame, another one of these, in the sub basement. So this is giving us a, a little bit of evidence. Um, but I like to think that that particular uh, letter of their CWR does, in fact, refer to the cabinet war room. Right, uh, we've got some more teasers. Comfy armchairs here. Could well have been a social club. Probably not. Uh, I think this was uh, actually a recording studio. Um, but certainly a lot of leisure activities did uh, this room. Bathroom? Huh? Bathroom? No, no, no. There's no toilet. Yeah, there's no toilet. any more from my tour up there. Over. There are no bathrooms down here. There are no toilets down here. Um, there are no dormitories down here. No. Remember, this was a three-level structure. They were all on top. Um, but if the bunker was sealed, uh, then certainly you would have had only a fire bucket, or you would have had to hang on. Um, this room was, in fact, a battery room. The reason we've got tiles on the floor, Darlington tiles they're called, is because the batteries would have been lead acid, like you have in your car. If they uh, tip over, <coughs> car battery uh, tipping over on the shag pile, bad news. Uh, so you have a tile floor, so the battery acid can be uh, washed off. At the back of the room, uh, there would have been a sink. In fact, there's still an old sink there, but I think that's probably more recent. Uh, so there would have been two uh, banks of batteries here and battery chargers. And the reason they have the batteries is because telephone exchange equipment always runs from batteries. It doesn't run from the mains. Uh, that runs from batteries. So uh, the battery room is always located next to the telephone exchange. No. We used to go through there, but there's been a bit of a roof fall, so we'll go back uh, this way. As you look, as you come past this slot in the wall, about the bunker, all for use between 1940 and 1943. So it only had three years of use, and even then, the war cabinet only met here twice in uh, October 1940 and March 1941. So as soon as Anson was ready, Churchill moved all his furniture uh, out of this bunker and into Anson. Now where did he sleep when he was here? Uh, a couple of people have mentioned sleeping. Uh, we've already decided that there were no bathrooms here, there was no, uh, no toilets here, they were all upstairs. Um, if Churchill was sealed in here, uh, it would have been camp beds or just sleeping on the floor. But he did have uh, accommodation about 400 yards away. Um, in, at the end of uh, Brook Road, turn left into Doris Hill Lane, and immediately you'll see a block of flats called Neville's Court. Uh, those had only been completed just to, before the start of the war, so they were immediately commandeered uh, and, had been, and was, were converted into uh, overnight accommodation for uh, the senior officials down here, the senior military and government officials. Two of the flats were knocked into one and strengthened, and that is where Churchill uh, would have spent the night um, if the bunker wasn't actually sealed down. Uh, other military personnel were billeted in local schools, so there was accommodation for everyone, but it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't on site. Um, now what about eating? Uh, we seem to be catching up with the, uh, the rest of the tour, so before we move along to the kitchen, I'll tell you a little bit more about later use of the bunker. Uh, it was uh, decommissioned in 1944 and was sealed up. Uh, the post office, uh, after the war, still used the research station. That was still actively used until the 1960s when they eventually moved to Martlesham Heath in Suffolk. Um, once the post office had gone, 
uh, Schweppes took over the site uh, as their uh, headquarters, um, but I think that was only uh, for a few years. They took over the whole site. Uh, when they moved out, the Dollis Hill Trading Estate uh, was established, uh, and part of that is still there today, although I think its future is uh, somewhat uncertain. But nobody used the bunker. And there were several proposals during the Cold War uh, for a use for the bunker. Certainly there was a bunker mentality uh, in the 1950s. Uh, at the start of the Cold War, everybody needed to have a bunker. Uh, and a series of regional war rooms were set up uh, around the country um, so that each individual region uh, could be totally self-governing in the event of a nuclear attack. London was divided into four regions, uh, northwest, southwest, northeast, southeast. Each of them had a bunker. And it was suggested that this could be the central control bunker that these four uh, regional control bunkers could report to. Um, but uh, it was decided that the North Rotunda would be more suitable. Uh, so in fact, <coughs> uh, uh, there was no use found for this in the 1950s. Again in the 1980s, uh, there were further proposals uh, to use this bunker. One of the uh, regional war rooms in London, that at, uh, by, by that time there were five, uh, but the one at Mill Hill, Partingdale Mill Hill, uh, they decided it was too damp and they were looking for a replacement for it. So uh, it was considered that it could come here. Um, but Ken Livingston threw the uh, plan from Brent Council uh, towards the end of the 1990s. Uh, one of the requirements when they bought the site was that they maintained uh, the bunker and opened it up two days a year to the public. Unfortunately, when they were building the housing, the contractors damaged the structure of the bunker and it flooded, which I told you uh, downstairs about the flood water to a depth of two feet. That didn't used to be there, that only appeared in, in the 1990s. Uh, uh, nobody admitted responsibility for it, uh, and uh, uh, network were unable to uh, uh, get any money back from the contractors uh, to, to remedy the situation. Uh, and in fact, it would cost uh, half a million pounds now uh, to have this sorted out. So we do have uh, pumps installed, which we keep running all the time, so if the water level starts to rise, uh, we can pump the water out. Um, each time we do open to the public, uh, there is perhaps a couple of inches of water on the floor uh, and we have to have that all cleared up the day before. So we had the contractors in yesterday uh, with industrial vacuum cleaners that actually hoover up the water. We uh, sweep it into the sumps and uh, hoover up what we can and uh, make it safe for you to come down. Right, I think the other party has moved on. Quite obviously a kitchen. Uh, a bit small you might be thinking. Um, where would they have had their meals? Well in fact they didn't have meals here at all. This was really only for snacks. <coughs> Uh, and for cups of tea which would have been uh, served through the serving hatch in the wall just as you pass by. Uh, the meals would have been at the uh, main canteen of the post office research station which would have been unfortunate in the event of the bunker having to be sealed down because uh, you wouldn't be able to get up there. So certainly there would have been some food uh, served here in an emergency. We thought we'd actually found some wartime rations here but uh, taking a look it's uh, tins of caustic soda so I doubt if that would have been uh, a lot of use to people. So we've got very basic facilities here, we've got a couple of old butler sinks, uh, there would have been uh, uh, a water heater here to, uh, uh, for hot water and to make cups of tea, um, some food preparation services, but very basic facilities. So if the bunker had have been sealed down, it wouldn't have been the nicest place uh, to have survived. No beds, no toilets, no real meals. Um, no communication with uh, friends and loved ones, um, but the idea it was only ever going to be needed for a very short period, immediately after uh, a gas attack, uh, when it was necessary to uh, totally seal the bunker from the outside. But the bunker was totally self-sufficient, but it was never intended to be for any long period. Right, if you'd like to follow me down to the bottom of the stairs. Uh, and they came out as far as Maida Vale uh, and to Liverpool Street. So they run right through central London. In fact, they, would, uh, they were planning to uh, extend them onto Edgware. Uh, and uh, I think it's Hyde House in uh, Hendon. Uh, they actually, when they built that, the lift shaft was going to go down a further 100 feet uh, to the tunnels. The shaft does go down. They never built the tunnels, 
um, and below sort of ground level now the bottom of the shaft is flooded. Uh, but certainly the tunnels still run from Maida Vale to Liverpool Street with a branch running right along Whitehall uh, and linking to the new Home Office building in Marsham Street. Um, all still there, all still accessible, all still used for carrying cables. Um, they link to Downing Street, uh, but uh, Tony Blair isn't allowed uh, anywhere near them. Uh, there might be a door uh, in his house, but he's not allowed to use it because he hasn't got the right security clearance. The only people who can use uh, those tunnels and that, door and, that, and, those and that doorway are authorised BT people. Um, so it's a network of tunnels we would love to get into, which uh, we haven't been allowed in yet, but we're still hopeful that one day we might. But they are there 100 feet below central London uh, carrying our cables. I have seen one doorway. Um, there was a protected telephone exchange uh, near St Paul's, uh, the Kingsway Telephone Exchange. It was built uh, in the 1950s during the Cold War and it utilised one of the uh, deep level shelters built during World War II that were originally going to be part of a, uh, an express tube network. Um, uh, they commandeered the uh, express tube tunnels and they built a series of deep level shelters uh, in south, north and central London. And one of these uh, later became the Kingsway Telephone Exchange. And there is a door into the deep level cable network from there. When we went down there we were told, oh you mustn't go anywhere near that door, uh, mustn't photograph it, mustn't see it, and then they just left us to it. <laughs> so somehow I managed to find my way to that door and somehow there's a picture of it on our website. Um, <laughs> But it's just a door. It, it, it's nothing more than that, but it does lead into the deep level cable network. Right, a little bit more about the organisation that I belong to, Subterranean Britannica. Uh, we were formed in 1974, uh, and uh, our brief is to uh, research and explore man-made and man-used underground spaces uh, anywhere in the world. Um, we do it in, uh, in Britain, in Europe, uh, and in other faraway places. Uh, if it's underground and it's uh, not open to the public, then we'll be down there. Um, it would be not just bunkers, <coughs> it would be railway tunnels, it would be sewers, drains, grottos, um, mines, disused mines, anything underground. If you'd like to find out a bit more about uh, Subterranean Britannica, we have a leaflet, uh, which uh, I'll happily give you up on the surface, and uh, if anyone wants to join us, you'd be very welcome. We have an extensive website, uh, which will tell you all about the uh, kind of places we visit. Right, can I ask you to keep your hard hats on until you get uh, through the doorway at the top of the stairs and then hand your hard hat to uh, one of our staff at the top. Hope you enjoyed the bunker and uh, do come and see us another time. Thank you very much.